Welcome. I'm here with Andrew Steele, who is uh, joining us today, and I'm really excited because Andrew has written a new book called Ageless, and I'll let Andrew share a little bit more about that in a moment. But first, I want to give Andrew a proper introduction. Andrew has a master's and a PhD in physics from University of Oxford. And Andrew, can you maybe share with us a little bit about how your background in physics has, to your perception, helped you understand and get passionate about the longevity uh, movement? Yeah, of course. Hi, Brent, and uh, thanks for having me on Lifespan. Um, it's, a, it's been a sort of fascinating process for me because I started reading about aging biology toward the end of my physics PhD. So obviously it's not a natural, obvious fit to go from physics into biology. But I just decided, you know, I was driven by the numbers. I thought this is the single largest humanitarian challenge of our time. And that's what I describe it as in the book. And so I just had to change career. I had to you know, perhaps understand whether maybe I was approaching this naively as a physicist. And, you know, there was some fundamental biological impasse, which is why biologists didn't seem to be as interested in it as I thought they should be. Um, and actually, basically, I changed career because of a graph and that graph is the uh, graph of how likely you are to die depending on how old you are so obviously your viewers will be very familiar with the fact that humans risk of death doubles every eight years and if you just look at the graph you know, look at what that entails if i'm 36 now my odds of death this year are about one in a thousand i quite like those odds but obviously if you carry on doubling something we've all seen what happens with exponential growth when it comes to something like coronavirus that means that by the time i'm 90 if there haven't been any advances in medical technology in the intervening time my risk of death is going to be one in six and that's you know life and death at the roll of a dice and that's just terrifying and i think what um what the physics training really gave me from a, a sort of big picture aging point of view it just meant that i was immediately uh, spoken to by that kind of very statistical argument you know it, it, i wasn't like people people have often interviewed me and asked me you know did you have some terrible experience with death when you were younger or you know did you have some some older relative who had a really awful uh, aging process and came down with some terrible disease that they suffered with for many years but actually you know ultimately although these emotional things have affected me throughout my life um the main thing that really drove me was just the scale of this problem. And so I decided, as I say, that I had to work in biology to at the very least understand why this wasn't being addressed as much as I thought it should. And I ended up going into computational biology. So I ended up you know, using some of those sort of mathematical, statistical programming skills that I picked up during my physics training and applying those to biological systems. I started working in a lab uh, you, you, looking at C. elegans, so looking at aging in nematode worms um, and calculating various stuff for them. And then I moved into another lab doing um, mainly genomic stuff, so looking at DNA sequences, and uh, where different proteins bind to DNA and also using machine learning to analyze medical records. But what I really found during my five years working as a biologist was that biologists were surprisingly unaware of aging biology. You know, I'd often find myself in the room being the person who might know the most about a particular aging process. And this isn't a particular aspect of the aging process, I should say. And this isn't because I'm some kind of, you know, genius. It's just because I'd read a little bit about this stuff. And you find that people who had great PhDs or great degrees from great universities, they often hadn't had a lecture on aging biology. They hadn't read anything about it in their textbooks and so i just decided i've got to write a book about this because um you know the, the public aren't necessarily very aware the policy makers who fund the science aren't aware but even worse than that the scientists themselves often aren't aware of just how exciting this stuff is in the lab they think that it's you know kooky or sci-fi or you know maybe decades and decades away I just thought I've got to write this book to show people this isn't science fiction. This is something that's happening in labs all around the world right now. This is our single biggest problem as I sort of alluded to because of my career change due to a graph. I've got to get the word out there. And so that's why I ended up writing a book about it. Really exciting. And I completely agree with everything that you stated there as far as the, you know, uh, feelings and the importance on aging and how to me, I'll use the word mind boggling. That's the best <laughs> phrase I can think of, of how you can have these brilliant, you know, PhDs in biology, but yet they don't know much about geroscience or aging. And it, it is quite a head scratcher. And hopefully that will be it, it is changing slowly, but hopefully that change will accelerate in the next few years. Um, so the, the full title of your book, it's Ageless, The New Science of Getting Older Without Getting Old. And Lifespan.io's Arcady Mazin has uh, written up a good um, book review that's on Lifespan.io. We'll have it linked in the description below here. And Andrew, you also have your own YouTube channel, which I only found a few uh, weeks ago, and I just started binge watching. You got a lot of great stuff on there, not just about Thank you. aging, but also about, you know, coronavirus and just science in general. I, I just find you to be a very effective uh, science communicator, which we need more uh, people like that in the Jero science community. So uh, what do you want to say about, you know, your uh, YouTube channel or just in general, you know, how you came about with 
this strategy of you know doing youtube videos uh and things like that what what do you feel about that i completely agree with you actually that we just need to have a lot more excellent science communication that's what i'm you know ho hopefully trying to provide um my youtube channel is at youtube.com slash dr andrew Steele, and i do try and cover an awful lot of different topics because i feel like you know if you've got a single issue youtube channel if i was just talking about aging biology that's not necessarily going to reach the broadest possible audience because you know at the end of the day we've got this problem we sort of alluded to actually in the answer to the previous question what you were just saying i think the reason Reason that you know not necessarily that many biology PhDs know all that much about aging it's not their fault it's not that they're not smart I think it's a sort of sociological historical thing and the field has been very small historically that means there have been very few lecturers who've therefore lectured very few people about it who therefore you know don't go on to do PhDs in it who, and the field's small so it's sort of this self-perpetuating vicious circle and I think the same is true of aging biology in the broader consciousness it's just not necessarily that big a thing and actually you know there are a whole load of issues where bringing a scientific lens to it is important so my YouTube channel it's, it's a bit of a grab bag to be honest like you say there's some aging biology there's some coronavirus there's some stuff on things that i just found interesting like optical illusions because actually i think that just engendering that sort of passion about science and that way of looking at the world is the most important thing it's you know you, you can draw people in perhaps with an optical illusion but then show them something about how the power of understanding the world scientifically you know for example by looking at the aging process not as some inevitable part of being alive but as a biological phenomenon that we can understand and perhaps intervene in these are all different sides of the same piece of understanding, really. And so that's the, what I'm hoping to communicate with the science communication. Okay, fantastic. Well, I highly recommend Andrew's YouTube channel. There'll be a link in the description uh, below if you'd like to check that out. Um, so Andrew, just moving on uh, to focusing more on your book, Ageless. Uh, so can you kind of share with us the, the research um, that you did for this book uh, when you kind of decided, you know what, I'm going to write a book on aging and, uh, you know, how long you've been kind of researching aging. You, you talked about how, you know, uh, you kind of came into this, but can you give us a little bit of um, time perspective here and research and maybe people that you uh, reached out to or what other resources that you looked into? I mean, you mentioned the graph, which is really compelling. Uh, and I do want to say one thing real quick. You are correct. You didn't exactly say it, but most people, from my experience in the geroscience or longevity community, they kind of got into this from a personal experience with a friend or family member or their own uh, mortality coming into a question. That's kind of been my story. I had a grandmother um, in college who just withered her way, sadly. She was on eight pharmaceuticals in a nursing home. And it really got me to question, like, is this normal or is this something that's new? We've done really good at keeping people alive, but we haven't done a great job of increasing their health span and lifespan. So that's kind of my story. But um, so all those things, if, if you want to, uh, however you'd like to answer the question. Yeah, I mean, thinking about the last bit first, I think this is something that I've perhaps come to a bit late. And it's actually something I talk about in the book. I think a lot of people our age, you know, unless you're sort of fortunate enough is the wrong word but unless you're you know you're exposed to this experience that happened to you unless that happens you can often just have aging completely pass you by and i think a really good example is right now my parents are having you know they're spending a lot of time looking after uh, one of my grandparents and I'm basically insulated from that, you know, they're doing all the work. And the fact is that, you know, if they were doing all the work, if I didn't really hear, hear too much about that, um, you know, I've thankfully been relatively healthy myself throughout my life. You just don't interact with the healthcare system. You don't see, you know, what goes on behind the closed doors of hospitals, the closed doors of care homes. And so it's very easy to breeze through life till your 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe even your 60s, perhaps when you start confronting your own aging, or perhaps, you know, the aging of your parents, that these things can really start to hit home. So I think, you know, although I'm perhaps a bit weird and having been driven to it by this very uh, statistic, statistical route it's very easy actually to just not not get you know not get drawn into this in any way at all and actually one thing that has really sort of um well, it's provided me with an awful lot more emotional stories to tug on the heartstrings is my wife's a doctor and so you know every night she'd come home from work and tell me about all these terrible things that were happening on the ward and so often they were older people like it doesn't matter what ward you are it doesn't matter if you're looking at people with you know broken bones or people who are just in general medical wards or people with different kinds of cancer almost all of these people are older. You know, that's the reason they're in hospital effectively. And being older, it just massively complicates their care because, um, and, and you know, if, if you talk to a doctor about what they're taught about aging in medical school, it's not about the potential for anti-aging drugs, even though my wife is almost certainly gonna have a career which involves her prescribing some of these things. You know, it's very plausible that in, you know, five, 10, 20 years, these are gonna be drugs that are in the med medicine cabinet that she can give to patients. And yet, you know, as a medical trainee, she was given no warning that that was coming. What you're told about older people when you're training to be a doctor is that, um, you know they're very complicated they've got social issues at home perhaps that you know they might not be living with anybody which means they're gonna to have to be living on their own and navigating that world so you're gonna to have to you know, make their house safe like you say you know 
older people are often on uh, huge numbers of different kinds of medication. I think the average 80-year-old has five different medical diagnoses and is taking about the same number of drugs to treat those diagnoses. And so you're taught, oh, it's very complicated because you've got to think about how those medicines interact and make sure that a new medicine that you give them isn't going to detrimentally affect the other medicines or vice versa. So, you know, this is this very pragmatic approach to understanding it from medicine. But actually the stories, you know, when she first met me, I think she thought I was crazy because I was talking about, you know, this crazy sci-fi idea of treating aging as a medical condition. But as she's got to know me, well, thankfully, obviously, she changed her mind. And um, I think if you sort of view medicine through this lens, if you are a doctor and you know, you're thinking about the aging process as being behind a lot of these problems, it's just blindingly obvious when you have that lens. But so many people in society don't. Um, to answer the first part of your question about the book, it's been an incredibly long process, to be honest. So I first started reading about this stuff, um, as I say, back at the end of my PhD, which I finished in 2011. So it's sort of been in the back of my mind. I've been reading about these things, as, you know, alongside my working as a biologist. But the real meat of writing the book, um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, quit my job uh, as a scientist in 2018 to concentrate on writing full time. And I'm just so glad I got that opportunity because <laughs> it basically took me two years of full time work because, you know, for a few different reasons. I think firstly, aging biology, it's just... It covers literally every aspect of the biology of an organism. And obviously, you know, apart from the quite apart from the fact I was a trained physicist rather than a trained biologist, nobody can be an expert in every single system, right the way from the, you know, the very smallest molecules, the proteins, the DNA inside your cells, all the way zoomed out to the sort of medicine, the behavior of organs, the social aspects of gerontology, the ethics. It, it's not possible for a single individual to already be an expert in all of those things. And I certainly wouldn't consider myself to be one now, even though I've you know, spent all that time researching. The second factor was that because, I, you know, part of my mission here is to convince scientists you know I, I want this book to be accessible i want the public to be able to read it i want to be able to give it to you know members of parliament or members of congress or you know senators in the us you know, wherever you are in the world i want normal people <laughs> to, with apologies to scientists to be able to read this book but at the same time i want it to be really convincing to scientists i don't want them to think this is you know sort of flimsy unevidenced stuff which is uh, you know able to be dismissed so there are 400 references in the back of the book if any scientists do want to sort of chase up uh, you know the proper meat of the science that's behind the things that i'm talking about and that meant that, you know, if you see 400 references, that means I I think I've got something like 1,000, maybe 1,200 papers in the um, reference manager that I was using when I was writing the book. I'm not going to, you know, commit hand on heart to have read every single one of, you know, every single word of every single one of them. But at the same time, that's an awful lot of material. And I've also got, you know, thousands of notes that I've taken off, you know, websites and articles and all kinds of different things to try and pull together this information and synthesize it in what I hope is the most compelling possible way. Um, in terms of people I spoke to, I think I did 30 or 40 face-to-face -face interviews or Zoom Zoom interviews or you know whatever it was at various times uh, depending on where people were in the world because again it's just so so many different things you know there are scientists working on senescence there are scientists working on reprogramming on mitochondria on you know, basically multiple interviews per hallmark of aging so in in the book um i sort of i break everything up into what i 10 hallmarks of aging so obviously anyone who's familiar with the 2013 paper know they talk about nine i mixed things up a bit added one combined a few together and ended up somehow with 10. um but you know nonetheless if you think there's a couple of interviews per hallmark that's going to be an awful lot of people to talk to so it's just a really really big long process and i think that you know Everyone knows that writing a book takes a long time, but I was just surprised by the sheer scale of that challenge. And then, you know, writing more than you need and, and having to cut it back down again after you're, you know, having had, had comments from your editors. It's a really, really long job, but it's, it is a, it's a very satisfying one. I think it's a very, it's one that I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to do. Because the other really cool thing about writing a book is you can email, you know, any scientist in the world. And obviously scientists do love talking about their research, but the fact that you're writing a book just gets you access to these incredible smart people, you know, absolute you know, top people in their field and just to be able to go and chat with them and ask, you know, my, my often stupid questions. It was just an absolute luxury. And I'm, uh, yeah, I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity. That's fantastic. I do kind of share that with you a little bit because I've interviewed quite a number of longevity scientists over the years. And quite frankly, yeah, just getting access to them and their brilliance has, has been, I just feel very um, blessed and I have great gratitude for that. And you as well, you know, just networking with these people who have just kind of figured out that aging is really important and it's the, the biggest problem on this planet. If you define a problem as human suffering, I think that's a good way to define like a, a problem for us, you know, globally. About 150,000 people die every day globally on average daily. And about 110,000 of those are from aging or age related diseases. So it's over two thirds of the reasons why people are dying and really if you realize this, people aren't just dying normally from aging. There's normally lots of suffering for many years, if not a decade or decades leading up to that and suffering 
uh, physically, emotionally, um, financially, and even spiritually, and then the effects and the ramifications that can have on their entire family as well, too. It's a massive problem. So how do you see this, you know, playing out in the next few um, years and decades? And I know that I'm asking an incredibly difficult question, but what do you think is like most realistic based off, you know, you know, 10 years researching this, writing the book, interviewing or, you know, speaking with all of these other experts, how do you think this is going to play out in the next 10, 20 years, your best guess? Yeah, the way I normally ask answer this question, I do get asked it a lot, obviously journalists love to know about timeframes. I sound like I'm dodging the question, but actually I'm really, really excited. So let me sort of give you the answer that I'd normally give. Um, and that's to say that I think these therapies are going to arrive in time for most people alive today. So let's unpack what that sort of thing means. Um, you know, th there are some things that are already in clinical trials. We've got the really easy stuff, you know, think about your your, your uh, metformins, your hermicins, you know, metformin, as soon as the TAME trial gets going, that's this massive attempt to randomize control trial uh, on metformin. You know, if that works, it could be you know three years we find out if the people in the metformin arm of the study not taking the placebo live longer get less age-related disease that's something we could roll out immediately because that's a drug that's got an incredibly well understood safety profile we've been prescribing it in the uk for about 50 years now i think it was in the 50s so it's 70 years isn't it it's an incredibly long time ago um in the us i think there are 80 million prescriptions for metformin written every year so this is a fantastically safe drug it's effectively trivial to you know start rolling that out to people over the age of 60 for example if we work out that it's safe so there's the really really easy stuff that could happen very soon slightly uh, pro probably slightly behind it but i guess we'll have to see uh, the things like the senolytics they're already in human trials admittedly at the moment those human trials are currently for specific diseases where we know that senescent cells are a problem but then you know if if they're effective but most importantly if they're safe we can think about broadening the um remit for these drugs and i think this is actually a really common story in all different um sort of fields of aging research in that you know if you've got some experimental therapy if you've got senolytics or if you've got telomerase or something um you might be thinking about giving these to people who've got particular diseases where we know that hallmark is particularly important and that's because those people they might have quite a poor prognosis they might be willing to take a bit of a punt basically on these experimental treatments and if there are some side effects or if there are some risks associated with something that's not really been tested in humans before they're a bit more willing to take those risks but if the drugs are effective so obviously if they work they remove the senescent cells they extend the telomeres or they uh, you know potentially treat some of these diseases but most importantly if they don't have serious side effects you might then think well you know we know that cardiovascular disease and sort of inflammation generally are driven by these senescent cells so perhaps you know we might start giving it to people who've got advanced heart disease or something like that and if it's again effective and safe in that population you can broaden it out to people whose heart disease is slightly less advanced and so on and so on and i think by that point things like the tame trial the other really cool thing about that, of course, is that it's trying to lay the groundwork for drugs that aren't necessarily treating a particular indication in terms of a disease, but are treating the aging process. So the sort of constellation problems that come with, with getting older, then um, that means that hopefully that a senolytic or, you know, one of these other sort of more near term medicines is going to be able to slot into that. And it wouldn't be surprising at all if that was possible within the next 10 years. Then in the sort of longer term, um, you know, by longer time, I'm talking maybe 10, 20 years, things like gene therapies and stem cell therapies. And again, these can sound kind of sci-fi when you're talking to people about them. But if you look at what's going on, you know, in labs and actually in hospitals as well around the world, we've got gene therapies now that are being approved. And again, the same process that I was just talking about is happening. These gene therapies are firstly, they're for the simple cases. They're for people who've got particular single gene disorders where fixing that particular gene will hopefully give them you know years and years of additional healthy life by fixing that very one narrow issue that they've got and again these are people who've got terrible diseases so are willing to take a punt even if i'm not entirely sure exactly you know what the side effects how effective the gene therapy is going to be and so on but we have approved gene therapies now we've got some really promising single gene targets for aging now as well so you know uh, we've got things like apoe you might be able to try and uh, modify your variant of apoe to make sure you've got the most longevity enhancing version of that you've got pcsk9 inhibitors which are drugs that inhibit this particular enzyme in the liver um, that can reduce uh, blood cholesterol and again you might think about going in and doing gene therapy for something like that so these are all options i think one of the things that's sort of a, a bit of a longer shot but i'm still somewhat excited about is this discovery of the gene in the amish population called pi1 or serpine one depending on whether you're talking about the gene or the protein um that seems to be able to extend longevity in that population by 10 healthy years which is absolutely incredible now of course you've got to be very careful with genes identified in isolated populations who might differ in their characteristics from you know people living in the rest of the world but if there are these individual you know basically longevity genes that can give people additional years of healthy life then we could imagine doing gene therapies for these things and i don't think it's mad sci-fi to think that we could be doing that in you know 10 20 maybe 30 years and that's plenty of time to be you know for people alive today to be excited about and then you know stem cell therapy you know, I, I could tell a similar kind of story there are things happening we're doing stem cell therapy for parkinson's and age-related macular degeneration and stuff like that so again it's going to be just a period of time for it to be able to be rolled out more widely for people who are just losing cells because they're getting older 
And then as we go like deeper and deeper into the future, um, toward the end of the book, the very last section of the last sort of science chapter uh, in the middle of the book, is talking about the idea of systems biology, a systems biology of aging. And that's the, um, the idea that, you know, although I've talked about everything in terms of the 10 hallmarks sort of so far in the book and, and thought very much about these hallmarks in isolation, actually we know that the human body is a massive interconnected system. And when we understand a bit more about the hallmarks of aging, it's not that surprising. So, you know, we know that telomeres getting shorter are one of the things that cause cells to become senescent. And one of the reasons that senescent cells accumulate in our bodies as we get older is because our immune system's working less effectively. And actually one of the reasons our immune system's working less effectively is because of that accumulation of senescent cells, because of the inflammation, because of the molecules those cells secrete, and actually because some of the cells in the immune system are becoming senescent themselves. So you can imagine drawing this like incredibly complicated spider diagram of all the different uh, processes and how they're all connected to one another. And what we'll probably find is that those 10 hallmarks aren't enough. You know, that's obviously a simplification that we've used to try and you know, help get a bit of a handle on the process and plan a way that we can try and start intervening in it. So the real way I think that we're going to intervene in aging ultimately is we're going to build these systems biology models of the human body. And then we're going to try and intervene in those uh, in, in a more intelligent sort of systems based way. So rather than going in and killing all the senescent cells, we'll understand from our complicated systems biology model that we want to kill the cells that have this particular profile of gene expression, but perhaps leave this other profile of gene expression unchanged. And that might correspond roughly to what we currently call senescent cells, or it might be something more complicated still. And the idea is that you can intervene in ever more subtle ways that can kind of keep the body in a, in a steady state of youthfulness for as long as possible. And as I was writing this, I was thinking, you know, Andrew, this is this is genuinely getting sci-fi. Now you've been trying to tell everyone this isn't science fiction, but you're talking about these computer models, you know, maybe advanced artificial intelligence pulling together all this information. But then I thought, you know what? You know, if you think about what happened 50 years ago, so back in the 1970s, I, I, I looked this up for an interview recently. In 1971, the first eight-inch floppy drive was released. So that just goes to show, you know, what, what has happened to computing technology in the intervening time. Computers have been, you know, doubling in speed roughly every 18 months on Moore's law. We've got, you know, advanced uh, artificial intelligence just starting to come online thanks to, you know, things like graphics processing units and more advanced specific processing units for specific types of jobs. We can fold proteins in computers now. Uh, we're getting better and better at that sort of thing. Um, and if you think on sort of the data side, obviously there's no point having some advanced artificial intelligence model if you don't have real world data to feed into it that it can learn from we've gone from you know in the 70s it was only a couple of decades or a decade or so since we discovered the structure of dna whereas now you can go and get your entire genome read for less than a thousand dollars and they can do it in an afternoon they can get those three thousand dna base pairs we can do proteomics now and look at every single protein inside a cell um and these techniques are just getting better and better all the time we've, and we obviously we've got things like medical records we can look at you know the entire population's complete medical history. We can start to put all of these things together. We can imagine building these systems biology models. They're not gonna be here in five years time, but I think it'd be crazy to bet against the next 50 years, not seeing advances of that sort. Perhaps they won't be fully fledged, complete computer models of a human, but there'll be something that begins to approximate that perhaps. And that means that, you know, I'm in my 30s. If I live another 30 or 40 years, and then potentially, you know, there'll be some analytics that have been approved by then, you know, we might know if metformin works, I might be able to have a sort of early gene therapy if I get lucky. That'll mean that I can live a little bit longer still. I can carry on, you know, trying to be healthy, trying to exercise, trying to eat well, trying to do all these things and extend my lifespan, you know, sort of the old fashioned way. Um, then it's not at all unlikely that I'll still be alive in my 80s in 50 years time. And those systems biology models could, you know, the first nascent results from those could be starting to come out and could be telling us, you know, this drug that we just never have expected to have any effect on aging, perhaps we can, you know, take a bit of that. And that'll, that'll optimize our aging in some way that it's very hard to describe using words because, you know, that's the, these models will be much more advanced than sort of language as a way of describing what's happening inside our bodies. So it's very hard to say, you know, it's not as though I'm going to make any prediction about how long I think I'm going to live or how long I think, you know, the, the, the longest human, um, lifespan is going to be once we developed all these technologies because the fact is we could get unlucky and none of this exciting stuff could pan out but i just think we've got so many different bets um, we've got multiple ideas for therapies for every one of those hallmarks and then there's the exciting idea that you know the more the longer you live the more of these therapies you can benefit from and the longer time that gives scientists to develop more therapies i just think it's very hard to say how long we're going to live and it also means that you know unless you're already unfortunately very old or have some you know really serious disease it's going to take your life soon or if you just get hit by a bus I think it's a very good chance that it's going to be in time for most people alive today. So that's how I end up giving the answer. Okay, fantastic. You threw out a lot of stuff there. So I'm just going to, um, a few things that I want to uh, just kind of follow up on is you mentioned the floppy disk, you know, from 1971. <laughs> you know, I'm also 36 like you. So, you know, we remember floppy disks when we were growing up and going to school. But there could be some younger audience members here in their 20s or maybe teenagers. You know, <laughs> You're like, what know is a floppy disk? <laughs> don't even know what a floppy disk is, right? And so it shows how much technology uh, changes. 
And um, another thing that I wanted to point out, you didn't really touch on it, but I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more on the misconception that aging is an increase in entropy, um, you know, which is inevitable according to the second law of thermodynamics. You know, can you, as a physicist, can you, I know you talk about this in the book, but can you give our audience right now just a little bit of, you know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think actually the most compelling, so there are two ways you can answer this, right? The first is just a physics uh, answer. And that's that if you state the second law of thermodynamics in full, what it says is that entropy will always increase. So, you know, disorder will always increase. Things will always fall apart in essence in a closed system. And what does a closed system mean? That means a system where you can't take energy in, you can't uh, basically excrete, you know, send out um, disorder. And actually, of course, humans aren't a closed system. No living thing is a closed system. You know, if you're a plant, you're not a closed system because you can absorb energy from sunlight and you can use that to, to create food. And then once you've got that sugar, you can use that sugar in chemical reactions, which can then export some of that entropy into the surrounding environment. So the universe as a whole, perhaps is a closed system, and so entropy will continue to increase. But as a life form living on a planet with a ready source of energy, then you're not a closed system at all and you can export some of that entropy but actually although that's a sort of a theoretical physics argument for this i think the more compelling argument is just there are creatures that don't age so not only is this not a law of physics it's not even a law of biology that creatures right. have to fall apart and that's because you know we can use these entropy decreasing biological mechanisms and like you know you say that it's just some kind of black box we've got no idea what they really do but if you look at something like a uh, giant galapagos tortoise the reason that's uh, there's a tortoise on the cover of my book is because tortoises are negligibly senescent i mentioned right back at the start that humans risk of death doubles every eight years galapagos tortoises risk of death doesn't double at all. Once they become adults, their risk of death is flat with time. And so what that means is they've found a way to export that entropy, you know, whatever whatever it is that's going on inside their cells, they don't have an increasing risk of death. They don't have an increasing risk of frailty or disease. They even say reproductively active up until old age, which I guess is something to aspire to. And what that means is that, you know, they're not aging in a very real sense. They aren't subject seemingly to this law of entropy. So clearly, I mean, it's not against the laws of physics because once you state the law in full, it's not a problem. And you might worry, well, but, you know, biology is complicated. Maybe systems, these, these things are always going to fall apart eventually. But the fact is, you know, it's not just tortoises. There are fish, there are salamanders. There's even the naked mole rat, which is a mammal. So phenomenally evolutionarily close to us. These creatures seem not to age. And so if we can just, you know, work out some of their tricks and perhaps use science to import those into our own biology, then there's no reason why we couldn't be, you know, it's certainly something we should be aiming for because it's clearly something that's biologically possible. Yeah. And I'll say back in March on Lifespan News, I was blown away by this. There was a study that just came out about big mouth buffalo fish, and I had never heard of them. But what was so mind boggling to me, second time I've used the mind boggling phrase, but it is. <laughs> is the big mouth buck buffalo fish appeared to be getting healthier as they age. They studied fish from, I believe it was age two to 102 years old fish. And the 102 year old ones were like healthier on like every single level. So that was really mind boggling to me. And I think that we should really research those fish more. And then who knows if we find other species that are like that as well, that not only because to me, like, you know, not aging is, is great. And I'd love that and humans. But if we can get healthier and healthier as we get older, that's like next level. And I wasn't even expecting that when that came out in March. So uh, maybe we can link that episode in the description. It's from March on our yeah. news channel. So it's very exciting. And I think that when you so, so that, that phenomenon is called negative senescence, it's not just negligible senescence It's actually increasing in health with age. And from an evolutionary perspective, um, we might expect organisms like fish to do that. And that's because um, the, the traditional evolution explanation for aging is that once you've had your kids, you don't really matter anymore as far as evolution is concerned because you passed on your genes. But that depends on the life course that evolution has chosen for you. So some fish have uh, what's called indeterminate growth, which means they just keep on getting bigger, they keep on getting stronger as they get older. And in fact, in particular, the female fish, there's a, a wonderful acronym that the biologists have come up with for this, which is BOFS, which is big, old, fat, fertile female fish. And a huge majority of the reproduction in fish populations is done by this sort of handful of incredibly healthy old matriarchs who are just churning out the eggs. The eggs they produce are far greater in quantity, they're far greater in quality, so they're more likely to grow out to be young healthy fish themselves. And that means that evolution has got an incredible incentive to keep these fish alive and healthy as long as possible. So evolution will custom design you an aging course, a lifespan, depending on the evolutionary reproductive strategy that you've chosen. And so these fish and you know, various other species have clearly done that. And also, I think you're right, we'll just keep on finding more and more of these because these are really hard studies to do. You know, I, I was just complaining about spending two years researching a book. How long is it going to take to do a proper lifespan study on, you know, tortoises or fish that are living, you know, tens, hundreds of years? The fact is, it's going to be at least decades of field work in order to get a really robust data set. Because what you really want to do is track individuals rather than looking at creatures isolated in time and trying to join the dots. 
So it's incredibly hard work. There are obviously millions of species in the world. You know, you've got to have a lot of dedicated ecologists who just study that one particular species with a laser focus for years and years and years to get the really good data. I think there are probably quite a lot of these species out there. It's just we haven't been looking hard enough for them. I completely agree. And, you know, the boffs that you just mentioned is in your book. Uh, so I find that very fascinating. I'm obsessed with this stuff and I had never heard of that. So what might be, you know, considering we're on Lifespan.io's, you know, channel here, what might be some other things about aging that you think uh, even, you know, very obsessive people who follow this science very closely for many years might not know that are in your book or just something that maybe isn't in your book that you've that you've um, recently learned that you want to throw out? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but the box. <laughs> If you add the box, then you might have some other stuff as well. I think one of the coolest things is the studies that I found on eunuchs. And there's a sort of long, long standing observation in aging biology that women tend to outlive men, and nobody really knows exactly why that is. It might be something to do with genetics, it might be to do with mitochondria. But one of the theories is that it might just be that testosterone is effectively a suicide hormone. And perhaps that's because it encourages us to sort of beef up, ready for reproduction early in life, but then doesn't care what's happened to us after we've reproduced. It might even be an evolutionary argument. And so there's been a bit of a sort of head scratcher over, you know, what happens if you castrate people, you know, if you lop off their testosterone producing organs, basically. And it's very, very hard to get data for this. This isn't necessarily something we're going to, you know, get an ethics committee approve a randomized controlled trial of these days. But there are some fantastic historical examples where this was done. And one of the coolest is in the Korean court. Uh, so in the court of the Korean Empire, way, way back in the day in the sort of 16 and 1700s. Uh, eunuchs were a very, very important set of figures. They used to manage all the palace business and that kind of thing. And bizarrely, the eunuchs actually have a family tree, because although they obviously can't reproduce themselves, uh, the eunuchs were allowed to adopt children. And so this sort of persisted throughout the generations. There was absolutely meticulous record keeping. And what you find is that the eunuchs live dramatically longer lives than other people of a similar social status who are alive at the same time. Um, I think there was, a, there was a eunuch who lived in the 1600s who lived to the age of 104 I think it was but you know over 100 years old at a time when life expectancy was probably somewhere around 30 or 40 years so these are you know incredibly long lifespans and if you compare that to the lifespans of the kings or the the, the emperors you know who are obviously the, the by far the most cosseted people they are living in this the same palace in an even more mollycoddled environment they were living into their 40s and 50s usually so these eunuchs had fantastically long lives and I just thought that was such a fascinating idea and it, it, I think the thing that I found most fascinating and bizarre about it was this is actually an intervention that I could do right i could uh, i could go and probably you know my wife's a doctor she probably knows how to handle an anesthetic so she could technically probably do this for me and maybe you know given how much longer it seems to make these eunuchs live it could have a substantial impact on my lifespan um so there's just this bizarre sort of conflict that this is something i could possibly do that th i think the two things that stop me doing it firstly i quite enjoyed having testicles for various reasons but secondly that you know we don't really know how this works in terms of when the impact of that lack of testosterone is because these korean uh eunuchs they were um they were uh, castrated when they were at a very, very young age. And it might be that the crucial impact of testosterone is sometime during development. You know, maybe not having testosterone during puberty is the thing that confers that lifespan benefit. And if so, lopping mine off at 36 might not have any benefits in terms of longevity and might have some other negative lifestyle consequences. So, you know, it, I know it's we'll just this- some for sure, at least, yeah. <laughs> so it's just this fascinating thing that this is something that, um, it's on the table to for want of a slightly better phrase right now that this is something i could do and yet um you know this is this fantastic historical precedent we just don't understand enough about the aging biology for me, for me to be confidently recommending castration for myself or anyone else at this stage yeah definitely definitely um a few minutes ago andrew when you were mentioning you know the different therapies that you thought would would be more advanced in the next 10 20 years or so um there are a couple that i'm personally excited about that i'd love to get your thoughts on one would be um that you didn't mention one would be cellular reprogramming with kind of like yamanaka factors and then the other would be just kind of uh anything related to plasma proteins in the blood uh plasmapheresis um parabiosis you know when the animals are actually sewn together obviously we're not going to sew humans together so it's it's i think what's come out is it's the actual proteins that are in the plasma is what's seem to have a very strong epigenetic uh, impact on the human body and, and other mammals, at least. So what are your what are your thoughts on those two things, just kind of plasma related therapies and also uh, cellular reprogramming? I'm really fascinated by both of those and actually pretty excited about the cellular reprogramming in particular. Um, but it's a, it's a really funny one, cellular reprogramming. I, I think of it as a technology that feels like it's fallen through a wormhole from the future because we've got this sort of absolutely bizarre discovery, you know, that 
the Yamanaka factors when they were first uncovered. This was Shinya Yamanaka, got a Nobel Prize, was doing this research in sort of the mid-2000s, looking for genes that could make uh, regular adult cells back into stem cells. And what he was interested in wasn't uh, rejuvenating their ageing process, it was turning back the clock in terms of um, what they could differentiate into. So he wanted to turn one, one type of cell into another. But it turns out that these same four proteins that he discovered had this incredible and incredibly wide-ranging rejuvenative effects. So they turn back the epigenetic clock, they improve the health of the cell, things like the mitochondria get healthier as well. And I don't, we just don't fully understand exactly why that is. And the reason I say this is sort of like a technology that's fallen through a wormhole from the future, it's got this incredible power to reju rejuvenate individual cells. We've shown that by doing it intermittently in mice, it seems to be able to improve, uh, you know, what looks like their health span as well. Results are still coming in. The real question is, can we turn what seems to be an incredibly exciting sort of idea in a Petri dish into a therapy that we want to give to humans? Because these are very, very powerful genes. I certainly, you know, I might think about signing up for an APOE gene therapy or something in the next, you know, few years, if that was something that were on the table. That's, uh, you know, something I'd consider. But I certainly wouldn't be injecting myself with the Yamanaka factors anytime soon. So the real question is, can we either come up with a safer way of uh, doing that same thing? Can we come up with a different combination of genes that's perhaps got a, a bit less wild, wide-ranging implications? Perhaps the best case scenario is can we come up with a drug that could emulate that, could either stimulate the Yamanaka factors inside your own cells, or perhaps come up with some other way of applying that same effect, that same level of rejuvenation? So that's the real challenge I see there, is that this is a fantastically exciting bit of tech, but at the same time, it's just a bit of a head scratch as to how we're actually going to implement it. And I'm really glad that we're seeing some serious money being poured into that. The, the news that obviously Altos Labs and the billionaires are sort of coming in to bring a bit of investment into that field. Hopefully that's really going to spur that forward. And of course, there are the results from Calico earlier in the year as well, showing that they've been looking into which genes can try and do this in a slightly more controlled way. So it's really cool that there's a big buzz around that. And I'm absolutely fascinated to see how we can turn this into some kind of therapy. Um, and I think the same is true of the plasmapheresis and all, all, all this kind of stuff. You know, we've got to try and work out, is it the... Uh, youthful factors in young blood that are helpful? Is it the dilution of the bad factors in older blood? Um, there's this idea that you could literally just put saline in and it, it seems to have some rejuvenative effects. There's all kinds of different research going on in this area. It's just a question of, you know, can we understand enough about this and can we turn it into a treatment? Because like you say, we don't want to be sewing people together. The best case scenario is obviously some kind of pill that you can just take that will either upregulate the youthful proteins or tamp down the effects of the age-related sort of aging-inducing ones. Uh, and it's just a question of, you know, can we work out exactly what's going on and turn that into some kind of therapy? But I think the sort of key with all of these things is that what excites me the most isn't necessarily that I think we're all going to be, you know, epigenetically reprogrammed to, you know, eternal youth or we're going to come up with some incredible thing out of the plasmapheresis. It's that we've just got this huge range of different approaches. We know about fasting and so we can try and understand the mechanisms behind that and turn those into drugs. We know about, uh, you know, reprogramming, we know about cellular senescence, we've got telomerase that I mentioned earlier, we've got stem cell treatments, we've got other kinds of gene therapy, we've just got so many ideas. And if literally none of these were to come to anything, I'd be staggered. And so I just think there's a huge amount of hope that, you know, at least a few of these things are going to turn out to work. They might even work synergistically and sort of have an additive effect above and beyond their individual effects. So that's just what I'm really hopeful about, that, you know, if at least some of these things are successful, we can have a massive impact on health spans around the world. I completely agree. And you were talking about all the different shots on goal that we have, so to speak, not your words, but mine. And one other one that, you know, just kind of uh, I became aware of within the last year is Jean Herbert. I think I'm butchering his name, but his book is Replacing Aging. He is at the um, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, I think they're with Neil, Neil Barzilai. And basically what he, his basic premise to my understanding is that, hey, the human body has 78 organs and we've replaced 77 of them. The only one that we haven't done is the brain. You know, we haven't, I don't think we've replaced 77 organs in one human, but I think he's <laughs> arguing that theoretically it's possible and there, you know, hopefully will be a successful brain transplant in a human soon as well too. So then the point is there is, hey, we could just replace all these organs and we could grow the organs, you know, artificially as well, too. So we don't have to take them from people eventually if you see all these technologies scaling out. So it's kind of mind boggling. It's the last time I've, I'll use the word in the interview, I promise, <laughs> to think about. But when you the point is that I think the point that you were making is that we have all these different shots on goal, all these different therapeutics and technologies. And one of them has to work. And heck, what if all of them to a certain degree work? And what if we use all of them uh, and they have, you know, synergistic effects where they work better uh, combined is what gets me excited. And, and I think that it's realistic as well. I want to uh, lead into something here now. I wanted to talk about COVID-19 a little bit and about the impact that you believe it's had on the longevity or geroscience community, I think there's been positives and there's been negatives um, for sure. Want to get your perspective on that. 
And I want to tie that into what you were just talking about as well, too. And I'm going to make it personal for me. My wife's grandmother is 97 years old right now. She's in a nursing home about 10 minutes from here where I am in California. And mainly it's like you said, it's, it's my wife's parents mainly, you know, taking care of her. It's the nursing home, but they're doing the brunt of the work. But, um, you know, her quality of life is, is really poor right now. And my dad's um, sister, my aunt, she's 73 and her Alzheimer's is advancing dramatically. So with my knowledge of certain, you know, therapeutics here, I think not only is their quality of life pretty much gone, but I don't think that they have much time left. I would love if we had some of these more unproven, um, but potentially really beneficial therapies to be some type of a, a gateway for them to try them if they wanted to. But then there's also a challenge of with my aunt having Alzheimer's, her, her brain is already gone. So she can't really make decisions for herself like that. So it's, it's actually really complex. If people haven't thought about these actual scenarios, how complex it becomes from a bioethical standpoint. And then the final thing I'll say on this, tying it back into what you were saying kind of at the beginning of the interview is that a lot of biologists actually don't know much about the biology of aging. They just haven't learned that they weren't trained in that. So I've actually found just personally from uh, my experience of looking at panels where they're talking about aging and, you know, uh, mass media and things like that, uh, certain things on TV of like the doctors. I remember this, this show called the doctors people might be familiar with. It's a daytime show in America. Um, bioethicists seem to always kind of, I seem to always disagree with them because I, I think it's, they don't, they don't know what I know. They're, they, they're very specialized and qualified in their own way. But I think that it's very important that we educate the audience on general information like what's in your book, Ageless. So, and that's why I think it's really important so that we can break through and start getting some people who are really hopeless and vulnerable, maybe a little bit of hope, but we got to be careful because that's where also the charlatans and the predators come in as well too in that scenario. So I know I just rambled on and talked about a lot, but how, how can you answer all these complex things that I just kind of laid out there? Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? To talk about the very first bit of your question, COVID, I think that it's it's a real opportunity in some ways. And that's an awful thing to say, obviously, about a pandemic, which has cost so many lives and ca caused so much suffering itself. But it's really illustrated to all of us. And I think, you know, the, the media pundits, just everybody has been constantly exposed to graphs. You know, if I changed career because of this exponential graph of mortality with time, we've all seen that same exponential graph of mortality from coronavirus, depending on how old you are. So, you know, an 80 year old pre-vaccine was literally hundreds of times more likely to die if they caught COVID than someone in their twenties was. And, you know, why is that? Well, fundamentally, of course, we all know it's the aging process. It's the aging immune system. It's the rest of the body aging, which means you're less resilient to, you know, certain kinds of attack. So, what we you know, one of the most general things we can do, we can obviously, we should put more money into researching specific viruses, specific diseases we think have the potential to go pandemic, but a really good general purpose medicine, what you know, pre to prevent the worst consequences of whatever the next pandemic might be, would just be to invest more in aging research. Because if we all had a 20 years younger immune system when the next pandemic comes along, we could dramatically reduce the number of people in hospital, we could dramatically reduce the number of people who die from it, and therefore dramatically reduce things like the economic costs that have obviously been enormous as well. So I think it's, that's, you know, that's a really powerful point in terms of a campaigning strategy for those of us who want to sort of champion aging biology. I think the real challenge is that um, it's still coming up against a bit of a brick wall. So I think that, you know, people imagine when they think about pandemics, the solution to th are things like vaccines, are things like lockdowns. And those are really important tools in our armory, and we absolutely shouldn't neglect those things. But at the same time, you know, you're trying to break through in a world where you know, the statistics are changing every day. We've got new variants emerging and we want to sort of step back and take the bigger picture. There's been quite a bit of talk about trying to do trials of things like rapamycin or rapalogs or metformin in older people to see if you can use that to improve their immunity. But I've spoken to some scientists who just had incredible difficulty getting those through the regulatory system. And again, I think it's just because of a lack of knowledge. So I was chatting to a scientist who was trying to do this with a rapalog and she was telling me that you know, when they when they tried to take it to doctors, doctors know that rapamycin is an immune suppressing drug. And of course, that's true in the context that most doctors prescribe it. It is given in relatively high doses as an immune suppressant. It's usually given to people with organ transplants in order to suppress their immune system and stop them rejecting that transplant. So when you go to some doctors and say, OK, uh, what we want to do is give a preventative dose of a drug that's a bit similar to rapamycin to a bunch of 90 year olds in a care home, they just look at you like you're absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah. And you, um, you know, you say, look, we're not trying, we're going to have a much lower dose or we're going to have an intermittent dosing schedule. Schedule, and we've got this, uh, you know, clinical trial evidence that shows that it can boost the response to vaccines. So it's not a crazy experiment at all, but just the lack of the understanding is something that's really impeded that particular effort. And I think that that just, um, 
It's disappointing because it's something that could really be a powerful incentive for policymakers to care about aging. And, you know, I just think we've really got to keep on banging that drum and telling people, you know, this 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 really is a, a potential solution to whatever the next future pandemic is. It doesn't matter if it's coronavirus, if it's flu, if it's some virus we haven't even discovered yet. The fact is that if everyone is biologically younger, they're almost certainly going to be able to fight it off more effectively. To talk about your second point, which was about, um, you know, trying to enroll older people into clinical trials. I think this is a really fascinating ethical debate. And I sort of talk a little bit about this in the very last chapter of the book, which is about trying to get from the science that we've got into actual medicine. And I think one of the big challenges we've got at the moment is that the perfect clinical trial for anti-aging therapy is to give it to a bunch of people. And ideally, you know, you want to start intervening early. Maybe you want to give it to a bunch of 35 year olds and then follow them for the next 50 years and see who dies first, whether it's the people getting the medicine or the people getting the control group. Um, the challenge of that, of course, is that loads and you know, millions and billions of people are going to die in the intervening time while you gather all that data. So we need to come up with faster ways of doing this. One of those is, of course, to have biomarkers of aging, you know, things like the epigenetic clocks that allow us to measure either your biological age as some kind of composite or allow you to measure specific aspects of our biology and you know watch how they change as we get older and see if we can slow down some of those changes. But I think the other thing we need to do is just be a bit more innovative about our approach to clinical trials. And it is a really tough area because, like you say, there's a lot of potential for snake oil. You've really got to make sure you get consent from people who, you know, who otherwise wouldn't be getting any medical treatment. You've got to explain to them what the pros and the cons of those things are. But I just really think if I was 65, you know, not necessarily in terrible health, you know, maybe, maybe I'm doing all right. But if I had the opportunity to try a drug that wasn't probably wasn't that high risk because we had some evidence that it worked, you know, might have some evidence that it works in animals. I think you could lay that out to people and explain to them, you know, these are the pros, these are the cons. And not only might this benefit you, we don't know, but if it does work, then that knowledge is going to benefit every future generation who comes after you. I think I'd be perhaps quite willing to sign up for that kind of clinical trial if everything was laid out clearly for me. So obviously this is a conversation we need to have with, you know, society, with doctors, with regulators, with politicians, with ethicists, with scientists. There's a huge number of people who need to input into that process, but I do think it's something that we should be trying to do something about because, um, you know, we all know anecdotally, and it's just a just an internet search away, that there are biohackers out there taking rapamycin, taking metformin, taking wackier cocktails of things, quite frankly. And what's a great shame about that is that those experiments are happening in this really atomized, uncontrolled way. Every biohacker's got their own regimen, which they've cobbled together from papers and their own insight off the internet. And, you know, obviously they're ordering these drugs. They're not making them themselves at home, so they can't necessarily even be 100% sure that they're taking what they think they're taking. If these trials are just a bit more structured, if um, you know we could guarantee that the drug was what they thought it was and it was in the dose it was supposed to be in, and if we could collect data from these people, then we could start to understand things a little bit more clearly. And so, you know, the time is of the essence here. Like you said earlier, you know, over a hundred thousand people a day are dying of this stuff. So if you if you can advance a, a treatment for aging by a single day, you can save tens of thousands of lives potentially um, on, on a daily basis. So we do need to be looking at ways to accelerate these things. And I, I think the challenges you articulated are just uh, it really hit the nail on the head. It's just a question of how do we navigate these issues and how do we you know, save the most lives without imperiling people who are you know, currently alive today. But I really think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I'm pretty hopeful that if we try and you know, widen that conversation and most crucially, you know, this is why I really want to spread the word about the fact that aging biology isn't sci-fi. I think if people thought this wasn't some wacky scientific impossibility, they'd be much more willing to get involved. So I think that's probably the key message here. Yeah, I completely agree, Andrew. So this has all been fantastic. And I just want to say regarding the biohacking stuff, you know, there's organizations out there that are trying to, you know, longevity startups that are trying to work on those things. There's open cures. Um, there is better humans working on a lot of centenarians, James Clements, uh, a company that's a nonprofit. There's also, you know, there, there's, there's many, many, uh, I have a startup longevity plan where I'm just kind of biohacking and doing things for myself and some friends and family. And we have, we're, we're partnering with many other uh, companies here. There's humanity, which has a great app that I'm now tracking a lot more stuff, but it still is a challenge if we're not doing it in the traditional clinical way of actually knowing like, is this metformin I'm taking every day actually metformin, you know, it, it it's, it's such a rabbit hole. It's so complex and I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. So you articulated things incredibly eloquently so that people can understand how uh, massive this uh, problem is and what we have to do to solve it. So uh, I think that this is probably a good place to end it, Andrew. I would love to end it by uh, encouraging everybody again to subscribe to your YouTube channel get the book, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, where are other places that they can get the book if for whatever reason people don't have access or don't want to use Amazon? 
If you want to buy the book, you can head to ageless.link and that will hopefully give you a list of shops uh, in whatever country you're in or just wherever you get your books. Um, it's also currently being translated, I think, into 11 languages. We've got a Russian one coming out, I think, the soonest. Then there's a Spanish one. There's quite a few more in the works. So if you want to read it in your own language, you know, just keep an eye on that. There's a translations page on my website too that will you know, tell you what's coming up. And finally, the paperback is coming out in the US and the UK in the first week of January 2022. So, you know, if you want to get a paperback copy hot off the press, then uh, watch this space. That's absolutely fantastic. We'll have a link in the description below. We'll also have a link to your Twitter and your LinkedIn. Follow Andrew on Twitter and LinkedIn. What other social media do we find you on? Are you on Instagram or other social platforms you'd like to plug? Yeah, I think if you're interested in the sort of nerdy science stuff, then uh, at Stato on Twitter is probably the best place for you. I'm also on Instagram where I post some longevity stuff and some just other <laughs> random science or photography or YouTube video type stuff, uh, which is Andrew J. Steele. I'm on Facebook as Dr. Andrew Steele. I'm on YouTube as Dr. Andrew Steele. Try and keep all these things as different as possible just to keep everyone on their toes. So yeah, I'm all over the internet and feel free to follow me wherever, wherever you like to get your stuff. Perfect. We'll have links in the description below. Andrew, final words, any final thoughts that you want to leave our audience with? I just think this is the most exciting science of our time. And I just really love it if everyone in this community can go out and tell their friends, you know, enthuse everybody about this. Because the way that we solve this problem, we need to do the science, we need to do the trials, we need to solve all kinds of regulatory issues. But at the end of the day, it's just about more people knowing about this stuff. And the more people know that this is real science, this isn't some wacky fringe, you know, crazy thing, then the greater the benefit to everybody, you know, to us, to our lifespans, to our friends, our families, and everyone around the world. So just go out there and spread the word. Very well said. Thank you so much for being here, Andrew. Thank you.